And we're ready. We're ready. So it's broadcasting now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. And thanks for everyone who's joining us online. Uh, my name is Eli Meyer, um, owner and founder of this odd little company, Aquabiomics, that focuses on DNA sequencing to test the microbiome, the microbial communities in a reef tank. Really grateful for the chance to come talk to you guys today because I've spent the last couple of years of my life looking at DNA sequences from aquariums. And when you spend time on such an obscure subject, it's just great to meet people who actually want to hear about it. So here's what I've prepared for you and I want to share with you today. I want to start um, by just giving you a brief intro about why we're doing this. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you some details about how this works. I promise to at least try not to bore you with these details. It won't be at the level that it is for you know, a graduate seminar, but I'm happy to answer any more detailed questions you might have about, about how it works. Um, talk about what we've learned over the last two years. We've been running this for about two years now, sampled hundreds of tanks. I think we're well over a thousand samples in the database. And so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the lessons that we've learned from all of that testing tell you about some of the pathogens. This is one of the top reasons people want to test their tanks is to find out, is there something in my tank that's gonna kill my fish or corals? We'll touch briefly on, oops, I don't know what I did there. Okay, I'm, good. I'm trying to bring up a challenge just to verify that was on the other end here. Great. In here. Um, we'll talk about tuning the microbiome. That is, how can you make adjustments to the microbial community in your tank once you've learned what's in it? And finally, at the very end, I'll give you a little teaser about what's coming next in the development of the company. Okay, so let's start out with some of the, some of the background. Why are we doing this? This is one of these terrible ecology diagrams that you can't see any of the details in sort of by design. I say terrible because of the level of complexity. It's actually quite a nice graphic. I borrowed this from a PhD dissertation of a German student who made one of the nicest graphics that I could find to illustrate this concept. The concept is this, we think about these members of the reef, the corals and the fish and the invertebrates, but all of those animals and plants are connected by these invisible processes in the aquarium. There are microbes in the aquarium that are uh, changing the water chemistry and altering the flow of nutrients, nutrients that are flowing in between corals and fish. One of the best examples I can give you, one of the really well-known examples here, every time the fish pees, that's uh, a new source of nutrients in the aquarium, right? Ammonia. It's also very toxic and it is detoxified by microbes. Now, the, it's a big complex diagram and really the only point I want you to take away from it is every one of those arrows in the diagram is a process mediated by microbes. So microbes are doing all this important stuff in the, the reef ecosystem, but they're invisible and tiny. We don't know who's in the reef ecosystem, which microbes are there. And so we don't know what kind of capabilities they would have. And this is where D DNA sequencing comes in. So we're using DNA sequencing to shed light on these invisible players in the, the reef tank ecosystem. Um, this is my very simple, uh, broad overview of, of how it works. We're gonna get into more detail in a moment here. Basically, we have this unknown microbial community. We use DNA sequencing to identify and count the members of that community. That is, we ask who's there and how many of them. And we end up with this, um, this data set that tells us who's there and how many. Okay, so let's get into a little more detail. Again, I promise, I promise to, not, not make this into a, uh, into a biology lecture. Uh, let's start with the logistics of sampling, okay? So we mail you a kit. Um, the kit contains, I intended to get one of these out, but it doesn't matter. Um, the kit contains some equipment for sampling your, equip, your, uh, your aquarium. We give you a, a syringe and a, a filter that you can use to sample some water from your aquarium push the water through the filter and that, that captures the microbes on the filter. You send that filter back to us. Yeah. They can't, thank you. I'll use the, that's good, thank you. Like I said, I missed the Zoom revolution, you know. 
Okay, so um, you sample the microbes in your water using this syringe and filter. And we also ask you to sample the biofilm in your tank. This is really important because a lot of the nutrient processing microbes in the community actually are much more abundant in the biofilm than they are in the water. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. There's if you ever stick your hand in the aquarium and touch something, even the glass, you'll feel that it's slimy. That slime you're feeling is a coat of bacteria. And that that community, the biofilm community is very different than the community that's swimming around in the water. And that's why we take both samples. OK, so you register that sample and then you ship it back to us in the prepaid envelope. So really what the user has to do is not terribly complicated. It's not that much more complicated than any of the water chemistry tests that any of you would do. Now here's what happens when it gets back to us in the lab. We start with the DNA extraction. She, you've shipped me a sample. I need to purify just the DNA out of that sample and get rid of everything else. We use a fun method here. It's a magnetic bead based method, tiny microscopic magnetic beads. The DNA sticks to these magnetic beads the other stuff in the sample does not. And so we're able then to wash all of the other stuff away and we're left with just the DNA. We then change the chemistry, the DNA falls off of the beads and we're able to collect the DNA. Great, now I've got purified DNA from your sample. Next, this is where the real magic happens. So we use a process here called the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. This is a way of targeting a specific piece of that DNA. So think about the DNA as a massive book, like a dictionary. It's too big to sit there and read through the whole thing and understand it. We're not gonna try to read through the whole thing. Instead, we're just gonna read, let's say it's page 10 of every book in the library, okay? We just read one part of it. And the way we decide how to read one part of it is this process called PCR. We target a specific piece of the bacterial genome. I've given you the specific details here for any biologists in the audience. But let's just think about it as the target, okay? It's that same piece of every bacterial genome. We're gonna focus on that for every bug in the tube. So this process takes the bacterial DNA and it makes billions and billions of copies of just the piece that we're interested in, right? Just this red bit in the middle. Best analogy I ever heard for PCR. It's like you're looking for a needle in a haystack so what you do is you make a billion copies of the needle so you don't even see the haystack anymore. That's really what we're doing here in PCR. We're just making so much of this target that effectively that's all that's left in the tube. Now there's something important here that I haven't told you. Um, when I give graduate seminars on this, there's a one hour long lecture about exactly how this process works. This polymerase chain reaction um, attaches some pieces of very special artificial DNA to the ends. Um, some of that is secret sauce and some of that is just boring details that we don't need to know for the purposes of this discussion. But if anybody's interested in it, I'd be happy to talk to you later. Um, okay, so that's what we do in the lab. We take your sample, extract the DNA and make billions of copies of just the piece of DNA we care about. Now we send it off to a DNA sequencer. I'm showing you here a picture of the sequencing machine that we use currently for this process. Um, it's made by a company called Illumina. The instrument's called the MySeq. This instrument costs over $100,000. I can't afford this thing. So I'm doing exactly the same thing that most university researchers are doing. That is, I'm outsourcing just this one part of the process to a professional facility that all they do all day long is run this machine. Um, so again, nothing unusual about what we're doing. We just, we make the stuff in lab, we send it to the sequencer, they send us back the data. At the end of this process, we get 1 million DNA sequences for every batch. Boy, that is the reason why it's a headache. Yeah, so to actually run the instrument takes about two days, but we often sit a week or two waiting for them to run the instrument. Uh, towards the end of, your talk, of the talk, we're gonna see some good news on that point though. Uh, we've, we hope to break through this bottleneck soon. Okay, so I make the samples in the lab. I get a million DNA sequences back from the sequencing facility. Now we need to make sense of them. This is what they really look like. When I get the sequences back from the DNA sequencing facility, this is what I get. I have a feeling my clients would not be happy if I simply sent this out to them. So we have to do more. Um, now, 
I don't want to show you DNA sequences like this anymore. It's kind of ugly to look at, and the human brain can't really deal with it. So instead of those sequences, let's just use colored lines, okay? These are our four or three DNA sequences. I'm going to explore now how we take those DNA sequences and make sense of them to give you meaningful results about your tank. The colors of these sequences indicate that each one is a different type of bacteria, but at this point in the process, we don't know who they are. We just know they're different. Okay, the first part of the process or one leg of the process is fairly complex. Um, we compare these sequences, thousands of them from every sample against this large database with over a million different types of bacteria in this database. Computationally, this is quite a challenging process, and we're really standing on the shoulders of giants here. I didn't invent any fancy code. Um, we're using a process called BLAST that was developed by one of the, one of the giants of computational biology. Um, it's a process that very efficiently does this comparison of um, thousands of sequences versus millions of other sequences, and just a few minutes later, I have my answer. So that part's pretty complicated. At the end of it, it gives us the names. Now we know the names of these bacteria. Um, and I've just given you here some examples of genus names that, of bacteria that happen to be very abundant in the aquarium. So that's how we find out who's in the sample. How do we find out how many are in the sample? Well, this one is much less complicated. We don't need any Nobel laureates involved here. You really just have to count. How many times did I find the purple sequence? Okay, well, now I know that that's Flavobacterium. So now I have two pieces of information. Flavobacterium occurred this many times, right? I have identity and amount. And so that's the kind of data that we get at the end of this process from your sample. We get who's in the sample and, and how much. So what does it look like? Do you have a control you put in there to figure out absolute accuracy of the process? Or is it just... <laughs> The process characterizing nothing. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is a this is a valuable question. There's a lot of kinds of controls that a person could could include in these. Um, one thing we always do is a negative control, and in my mind, this is the most important for these microbiome type analyses because there is microbial DNA everywhere. Um, unfortunately, most of it is E. coli, this human coliform bacteria from human feces. Um, that shows up in just everything. And in fact, that's a contaminant that shows up in our samples and we just strip it out because it's like, I, I, know, I know this was not a sewer sample, this was an aquarium <laughs> sample, right? Um, so um, the, the negative control is very important to, to demonstrate that um, what I'm amplifying in this sample actually is from the sample and not you know, uh, contaminants from the environment. Now, I think you mentioned another kind of control, kind of a spike in control to um, evaluate sort of the efficiency of the process yeah. and this sort of thing. Uh, these, are, these are valuable controls. We aren't currently using them. Um, Sorry, I'm an engineer. It, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> They're, I'm not arguing against the controls, just in terms of a production process, it's not sort of an every batch um, control. Um, yeah, there are a couple of controls like that that are occasionally used in this so the field. The results are good for relative results, but absolute accuracy is not. So, so talking about numbers, it's, it's worth clarifying this point about relative versus absolute. This is a pretty, pretty important um, distinction about the kind of data that you get from uh, DNA sequencing like this. It's always relative. That is, I can never tell you how many cells per milliliter or how many cells per aquarium. It's always going to be what fraction of the community is you know, this type versus that type. There are ways to get past that and make it an absolute, um, but it becomes quite expensive and laborious. So, yeah. Yes. You mentioned before the, the whole genome being like a book. Right. And you're looking for page 10. How do you do, that seems to match to me. Yeah, and, and that, that again, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I didn't, I didn't do this. So the, um, the, uh, the field of microbiology has identified a, a piece of the genome that is both variable enough to be useful for classification, but also similar enough that there are pieces of it that are identical. We target those identical pieces using in this, um, this molecular process of polymerase chain reaction, 
we actually put in pieces of DNA that stick to the identical pieces, they're conserved regions, and they then target the inside piece, which is uh, variable. Yeah, and that is that is quite a complex thing that a lot of people spent their careers, you know, finding the the right universal primers. And every year there's a new paper arguing about it and saying we need to change to these other universal primers. It is you're right to identify it. That is that is quite a trick. Eli, yes. Somebody asked a question. The audience. Repeat it. Repeat it. You got it. Directional yeah, yeah. I'll do that for future questions. Yes. Okay. So we talk about how we get here. Let's look at what do the data look like? What is the microbiome of a, of a reef tank look like? I like to start with this diagram that has no labels because that way you're not gonna get distracted reading all the labels. We can just look at the picture and absorb a few points. <laughs> the first point, I guess, let me orient you to the diagram. Each circle is a different type. So two different circles there may be very closely related, but if they're different at all, they're different circles, okay? Each circle is a different type. The different colors are different families. So you'll notice some circles share a color. That means it's two different types within the same family. And the different sizes represent the abundance of each type. Okay, so with that key in mind, let's absorb a few points about this. One, it's pretty diverse, right? There's a lot of different types of microbes in a, in a microbial community of a reef tank. Two, there's variation in the abundance, right? We have some really abundant families like this big blue guy in the middle. And we have, if I did my job right, I stripped that one out. But if I didn't, it would be in there. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have a lot of these rare guys, right? All the small circles. So um, there's a lot of variation in the abundance of the different types within the the community. However, important point here, notice that this thing is not dominated by a single type. We got a whole bunch of circles. You can see lots of different colors. Um, we do get samples back that are dominated by a single type. And it always, almost always indicates that there's been some major disruption in the tank recently. Uh, a healthy microbiome is balanced like this. And the last point I wanna make about this figure is the incredible knowledge gap in reef tank microbiomes. There are five circles in this figure that we knew something about before I started this project. The five gray circles, I guess six. There are six gray circles in this figure. Those gray circles are the nitrifying microbes that showed up in this sample. And 10 years ago, every reefer could have told me what the nitrifying microbes do. We all have some idea about what the nitrifying microbes do. All these other microbes in this community that's the knowledge gap. What do these other microbes do? They're important. I showed you that diagram at the beginning. We know that all of these processes are mediated by microbes, um, but we really didn't know much about the different types in the aquarium. So uh, there's a lot more in it than just the nitrifying microbes. Okay, let's put some labels on it now and start talking in specifics. What I just showed you a moment ago was each individual type represented as a different circle. And by the way, I kind of lied to you because I left out all the rarest types. The circles would just be too tiny. I think I cut it off at 1% maybe for this, this figure. Um, in this figure, what I'm showing you instead is uh, the family level classification. So I've summarized it here um, at the level of family instead of individual type and I've color coded them by family. Um, and I'm showing you really in the figure, the typical reef tank microbiome. If I take the average of a few hundred different reef tanks, this is what I end up with. This is a typical community. Six major families dominate, or six major families show up consistently, repeatedly in reef tank microbiomes. And I'm highlighting this, or I'm, I'm classifying this at the family level, because this is a level where we can draw some useful inferences about function. Um, if I were to classify it at the kingdom level, it would be useless because I would just tell you, you have bacteria in your tank, right? Um, and that group can do so many different things that that wouldn't be useful. If I were to classify it at the level of an individual type, again, that would be pretty useless because we haven't studied most of those individual types. So we don't, we in terms of the field of science don't know what most of the individual types do. 
But at the family level, we have pretty good information about what the different families can do. And so we, we summarize this at the family level because it gives us a good uh, functional summary. So let me uh, introduce you to a few of these uh, very common families that make up the reef tank microbiome. The Pelagiobacteraceae is pink group. This is the most abundant group on natural reefs. If you go out onto the Great Barrier Reef, your top three groups are gonna be two kinds of cyanobacteria and this guy, Pelagiobacteraceae. Globally, in the ocean worldwide, or if you were to count up every bacterium in the ocean worldwide, this is the most abundant family on the planet in the ocean. However, as you'll see later in the talk, in many reef tanks, this family has been completely wiped out by the decisions that the reef keeper made in setting up their aquarium. More on that later. Okay, so that's number one, the, the most abundant. Um, and that, by the way, is a free living group, true bacteria plankton swimming around in the water. They belong in the water. They, they're actively free swimming in the water. Now the rhodobacteria, rhodobacteriaceae, the, the orange group here, this is a group that's associated with surfaces. Remember I described the slimy coating inside of your tank? Um, that's mostly rhodobacteraceae. So dominant group in the, in the biofilm, also very abundant in detritus. Um, now I'm not suggesting that that is a problem. Doesn't mean your tank is too dirty if you have this in your tank. In fact, almost every tank has this in there. Um, but if you find that your community is dominated by rhodobacteraceae, that information might be useful. It might mean that really you do have an excess of detritus uh, in your tank. Okay, and the last group I'll highlight here, the Vibrionaceae, the bright pink group at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> Vibrionaceae includes several pathogens. Uh, most of the coral pathogens that we know that have been identified as pathogens are in the, the genus Vibrio in this family. There's also some fish pathogens but they're not all bad. In fact, almost every tank has Vibrionaceae and they, they are uh, directly associated with animal surfaces. So in fact, we find that uh, coral, coral aquaculture tanks often have really high levels of Vibrionaceae. And it's not that the corals are sick, it's just there's a lot of coral surface for Vibrio to grow on. Um, okay, so that was just a, brief, just a brief overview of some of the major families that, that live in the reef tank. And again, my point in, in introducing this to you is to, to say that we know something about the functions of these families and what kinds of habitats these families live in. Um, and so when we find them absent or we find them present in excess, it tells us something about the conditions in the aquarium. Please, yeah. Up on that last page. <clears throat> so uh, the biofilm, I'm bad at the scientific name. It's fine. The biofilm yep. uh, um, bacteria, yeah. if I goof, my swab and the sample kit mm -hmm. didn't get a biofilm successful. Is it more likely then that that would show up as a lower percentage? So, um, because it's kind of a sampling technique of right. pink looks like it's from the surface yeah. of open water, therefore, syringe red in this case looks like it's from the swab. Yeah, so uh, the question was about um, if, if the user made a mistake in sampling the biofilm, could they end up with kind of a distorted profile because yeah. of that mistake? Um, so a couple of answers to that. One, these figures that I show you in your reports, these, these community profiles, these are actually based just on the water sample. I do use the biofilm sample, but not for this particular part of the figure. And uh, one of the big reasons is um, there's, well, we can cover it all under this reason. There's variation in how people sample that biofilm sample. Not everybody has a return pipe that's set up the same way. Uh, my feeling is water can be sampled consistently. Biofilm is a bit harder. So we don't try to do the direct biofilm to, to biofilm comparisons. Um, I think if, if we were to do that, then yes, how you sampled your biofilm would, would certainly affect you know, what profile you got out of it. Yeah. Okay, so um, following on with this, this idea about there being different things in the, the biofilm versus the water, um, I've shown you here, this is a figure that really quantifies that point. What I've done is taken just a few of these families. Um, I, I chose them kind of arbitrarily just because these ones show big differences between biofilm and water. Um, just wanted to highlight this point that there really are big differences in the community. So the Pelagibacteraceae, that, that most abundant group that I told you about, 
super abundant in the water, this kind of light blue color, very rare in the biofilm, right? Same for the Altera monodaceae. This, by the way, is one of the groups that really blooms when you do carbon dosing in your tank. You'll see a, a big increase in the red bar. That's the Altera monodaceae. Another, uh, another group that's present mostly in the water, not so much in the biofilm. The biofilm has other things that are much more abundant there than in the water, the Rhodobacteraceae, Hyphomicrobiaceae. So different communities. But there's one, there's one last point I want to make here, okay? And that is, take a look at those, those water levels for the Rhodobacteraceae and the Hyphomicrobiaceae. These two groups that I've highlighted, these are not free-living groups. They're not swimming around in the water, but we're still finding them in the water, okay? Um, this is, I think, actually an important point for everyone to recognize that the water in an aquarium is pretty different than the water in the ocean. The water in an aquarium is constantly sloshing around through pipes and past glass. It's constantly coming in contact with surfaces. And so the water in an aquarium actually has a lot of these surface associated bacteria in it that you won't find if you go out and get clean water off the Great Barrier Reef. <clears throat> Okay, so it's a big diverse community. We've talked about the differences between the water community and the biofilm, but we haven't really gotten into much about function. So let's, let's talk about some of the important functions of this community. This is the, the number one function that everybody knows about, the nitrifying community. We know that fish pee in the tank and produce ammonia. Ammonia is toxic. And we would like to detoxify this stuff make it less toxic into things like nitrite and nitrate. If you go out and buy a saltwater fish, everybody in this room knows this, but somebody watching online may not. If you go out and buy a saltwater fish, you wanna have Nemo in your living room and you just put that fish in a tank of salt water, that fish will die within a couple of days. And that death will be because of ammonia poisoning. We need bacteria to process this poisonous ammonia and turn it into less toxic forms. Now, before we ever started this process, we knew that this was the overall chemical process. This was the conversion of ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. And we knew that there were uh, these, these broad groups of microbes that accomplished these processes, the ammonia oxidizing microbes and the uh, nitrate oxidizing, uh, I should say bacteria. Um, but we didn't know which ones were present in the tank. Which ones are doing most of the work? Now we do. So what we found is the ammonia oxidizing microbes actually are almost entirely not bacteria. The most important ammonia oxidizing microbes in your tank are archaea. They're not, ar not bacteria at all. They're no more closely related to bacteria than they are to you. Um, they just happen to be very small, just like bacteria are. Now there are ammonia oxidizing bacteria in there too. Uh, but by far the most abundant ammonia oxidizers in the tank are archaea. Mostly this genus Nitrosopumulus in the um, scene Archaeaceae, the uh, archaeal group of ammonia oxidizers. Yes. Archaea. Archaea, yeah. So they are little prokaryotic organisms. So um, the big distinction here, prokaryote versus eukaryote. Prokaryotes don't have any organelles inside their cells, they have very simple cells. Eukaryotes like us have much more complex cells, plants, animals, uh, fungi, right? Within the prokaryotes, you have the bacteria and the archaea. They split very early in evolutionary history. Um, it's a third domain of life as different from the bacteria and the eukarya as they are from each other. So it's not Amelia, it's, it's, it's not bacteria, it's not Amelia. Something it's something entirely, an entirely different domain from, from bacteria. So when did this, when did this emerge? You know, it's, it's certainly, um, there certainly was a time that we had less awareness of the archaea, um, but I think it's, I don't know, Andy, help me out. I'm going to say 10, 20 years at least, right? 75? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's not brand new, but it certainly is a the importance of archaea in the environment is um, something people have become increasingly aware of over time. Yeah. Um, okay, well, within the nitrite oxidizing group, it, it is truly all bacteria in this case, um, mostly just one family though. 
Again, just like the ammonia oxidizers, we mostly find just one family of bacteria, Nitrospira is the genus name in the Nitrospiraceae. Okay, so we've started out here with a process that we knew sort of vaguely what was happening, but we didn't know who was doing it. Now we know who's doing it, and actually we know who are the most important players in this process. Um, it's really Nitrospira and Nitrosopomulus. Another point I want to make about the nitrifying community, um, this may, this may uh, go against some conventional wisdom in the reefing forum community. Um, you've often heard that there's no bacteria that matter in the water, right? All the bacteria that matter are in the sand or on the rocks or on the surface. I'm going to show you some data here that initially supports that, but then we're going to blow that apart. Okay, so let's look at the two groups I just told you about, ammonia oxidizing microbes, AOM, and the NOB or nitrite oxidizing. In both cases, both of these groups are much more abundant in the biofilm than they are in the water. But there's a lot of water in your tank, right? I mean, this was a very small fraction of the water of your tank that was pushed through the filter. Um, I will argue with anybody who wants to say that there's no bacteria that matter in the water. There's a lot of nitrifying bacteria, just this one group, just the group we care the most about, they're in the water uh, at, at actually pretty high levels. Um, so I don't disagree, our data do not disagree with the idea that they're more abundant in the biofilm. I'm just saying there's actually a whole lot of them in the water too. Two to three times higher in biofilms than the water. Uh, another important uh, point that comes out of these, these comparisons is this, this comparison between ammonia oxidizers and nitrite oxidizers. Ammonia oxidizers are consistently 10 to 15 times higher, more abundant than the nitrite oxidizers. Why does that matter? It matters because if you have very low levels of ammonia oxidizers in your tank, it's likely you're going to have undetectable levels of nitrite oxidizers. If, if the nitrite oxidizers are always you know, 10 to 15 times lower, then the ammonia oxidizers, once the ammonia oxidizers get low enough around the limit of detection, then the nitrite oxidizers will be down here below the limit of detection. So it's important to keep this, this sort of ratio in mind for interpreting your results. And of course, I'll you know, try to convey this to you when I uh, send you your results. Um, if you find high AOM, but no NOB, that's weird. That suggests a deficiency, right? But if you find very low AOM and undetectable NOB, that doesn't really suggest a deficiency. It suggests an overall low level of the nitrifying community. Now, one thing that's um, emerged, the biggest surprise that's emerged from all this study of nitrifying communities is how much variation there is across people's tanks. And this may explain some of the looks that I'm, that I'm seeing here. What do you mean there could be undetectable nitrite oxidizers in my tank? Um, in fact, we find that there's, there's a lot of variation in both of these groups, but probably a quarter of the tanks that we sample have undetectable nitrite oxidizers. Um, so there's, there's more variation in these, these communities than we expected at the beginning. When we started this, people always talked about, is your tank cycled or not? Like, as if it was a yes or no question. Your tank is cycled or is not cycled. Have you seen more of an issue with those tanks when they have low levels, like more cyano, more dinos, that it's, sort of thing? It's, it's a complicated question to answer because there are alternative ways to process yeah. nutrients, right? So the answer to your question is yes, in cases where we don't see an alternative, right? If, if somebody has deficient NOB, and they're not doing any carbon dosing and they don't have a macro refugium or an algal scrubber, they've got nobody else to take up those nutrients, then we do see nuisance algae problems. But it's funny, I've, I've tested tanks that are beautiful, pristine, no algae problems or nutrient problems. They've got an algal scrubber or they do carbon dosing. They've got very low levels of nitrifying microbes. And in those cases, the low levels are not a problem. So I really, you know, this is one of the reasons we ask a lot of questions on our um, questionnaires when you submit a sample is to help both of us, the client and the, the service provider to, um, to make sense of the results. Because yeah, low levels of nitrifiers mean different things if you, if you have an alternative process 
versus if you don't. Okay, so summarizing the nitro, the nitrifying stuff, we found lots of variation um, in that kind of a surprising amount of variation. Turning now to some of the bad stuff. So the nitrifying microbes, those were the, the, some of the beneficial uh, microbes that you want to find in your tank. Here's some of the microbes that you don't want to find in your tank. Um, I'm showing you here the two most common bacterial pathogens of fish that we find in our tests. Um, these are really prevalent in the hobby, right? We're talking about 44% of tanks have Vibrio fortis. Now, the good news about this guy, to my knowledge, this has only been directly connected to disease in uh, seahorses and their relatives. Um, in some laboratory tests, it is a pathogen. If you really stress fish with it in an artificial setting, you can make anybody sick with it. But um, the only papers I've found that actually associate it with disease occurrence is, is in seahorses. So maybe it's not such a big deal if you find Vibrio fortis in your tank. Um, still nice to know it's there so you don't buy an expensive pipe fish and have him die a few days later. The second most prevalent pathogen that we find in the hobby, uh, Photobacterium damselae. So this is another, both of these guys are in that family of Vibrionaceae. Remember the family I pointed out that has lots of pathogens? Well, here's two of them. Photobacterium damselae. This is another fish pathogen. Um, I think this one showed up in 21%, something like this of tanks that we've tested. Um, so there's, there's some unknowns about this guy, all right? So one, we don't know the full range of fish that it affects. We know that the damsel family is susceptible. So that includes clownfish, damsels, and chromis. Um, we know that there are other families of fish that are susceptible from the fish aquaculture world where this is a major pathogen. Uh, but within the hobby, we're not really sure yet who's susceptible to it. Um, but since it's present in 21% of tanks, um, this is another one to keep your eyes on. Um, not easy to eradicate these things from your tank once they're present, but I would like to know it's in my tank. So I don't go out and buy some expensive fish that's known to be susceptible to this bug. Let's turn and talk about coral diseases. Um, now this is a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip here for a moment over a couple of the boring known coral pathogens. We've found aqua rickettsia roeri, we've found Serratia marcescens in a couple of tanks. Um, but let's skip over all of those because those are like known, published, established pathogens that show up really rarely in the hobby, not worth our time. This one is interesting though. This is a, an emerging disease in the Caribbean. The disease was given the unfortunate name SCTLD, stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures here um, that were sent to me, have a special connection to these. These were sent to me by a, a former student of mine who now has moved down to the Virgin Islands and is doing graduate work on this disease. And she sent me some pictures um, to share. So this is, this is the disease in nature, right? Clean water, the waves washing it over it, washing over it every day. Watch how quick this coral goes away. February 1st, we've got some white spots. A couple weeks later, half the coral colony, and this is a coral colony, I don't know, almost as big as this table, you know. What is that, about a month and a half, that entire coral colony has been wiped out. And again, that's in pristine conditions, right? I think you all know that when disease takes hold of a coral in a tank, it often goes a lot faster than that. Right? Okay, so um, SCTLD, this, this disease that's sweeping the Caribbean, um, this is currently a major focus of coral research um, and it's, it's ongoing research. We don't really have the final answers here, but a very recent paper published just in 2021 identified nine suspected pathogens that are consistently associated with this disease in the field. I got excited, man, nine new pathogens to screen for, great. So I went, went right in and screened for them. Oh crap, these things are pretty, common in the hobby. So two of them we're finding in about 20% of tanks. Um, this other guy, Nutella, that was maybe nine or 10%. And then this one, an unclassified member of the same family. These are all members of Rhodobacteriaceae, that um, biofilm associated family. Um, 
This one that I've highlighted in, in yellow on the bottom here, this is a really concerning one because every single sample, every single diseased sample that the researchers found in the field, without exception, had this guy in it. So that's like a really hot candidate. I don't want that thing in my tank. Fortunately, it's only in about 3% of tanks. Okay, so these pathogens that are contributing to a major disease in the field are now starting to pop up in aquaria too. Um, we don't know yet what are they doing in aquaria. We know that in the field, the research suggests that they behave as a group. In other words, having just one of these types of pathogen in your tank might not be the end of the world, but if you get two or three of them, they act together as sort of a pathogen community. Um, and so that's generally the advice that I'm giving clients when they see these. If you see one of the more common ones, maybe not a big deal, but if you see two or three of them, and especially if you see this really rare one that's consistently associated with disease, that is very likely to be responsible for the tissue loss disease uh, that you see in your, in your tank. That's a disease um, that we don't really know much about in the hobby yet, right? SCTLD. Here's, by contrast, a disease that in the hobby we probably know something about, brown jelly disease. This affects some of the most expensive corals in the hobby. I'm showing you here a picture of one of my torch corals. It's not the fanciest or the most expensive, but it's mine, so I'm attached to it and it's alive. It doesn't have any brown jelly disease. That's what they look like before brown jelly disease. All the tentacles extended, right? The early stages of brown jelly disease involve a retraction of all the tentacles. Some of you may have been unfortunate enough to see this. And then rapidly, hours to maybe a day or two, all that flesh dissolves into this horrible black brown jelly. Now, this happened to a bunch of my corals. And I said, hey, I know a guy who has a DNA testing service. Let's see what's in there. So we tested it. And it turned out that, um, that the majority of these communities, this brown jelly material, was almost all Archibacter. Um, so this is a, a specific type of Archibacter, um, unclassified at the species level. We know it's in the genus Archibacter. Don't have a species name for it. I call it type 1103. Just in our database, it's number 1103. Consistently associated with brown jelly disease. Found it consistently in my tanks. I've found it in other people's tanks that reported brown jelly disease. We've even found it in Europe. So it's not even just an American disease, right? It's across continents. This thing is associated with brown jelly disease. Now, some of you may have um, read on forums about associations of ciliates with brown jelly disease. This has been a longstanding theory because ciliates are also very abundant in that brown jelly material. Um, and so I think so far the stories are pretty similar, right? We have an abundant bacteria with the disease or we have an abundant ciliate. Which one is, is causing it? We have some data here that I think um, the ciliate theory has not um, approached. That is, we can show that if you knock out the bacterium with an antibiotic, it also cures the disease. So this was an experiment I did in one of my tanks. Um, before the brown jelly disease showed up, this pre-bar, you see there was none of this Archibacter. This thing was absent in my tank, wasn't present. And then one day I saw tons of brown jelly disease in my tank. So I took a water sample. Boom, we have a high level of this Archibacter. Okay, I decided to take a pretty extreme step. I decided to do an experimental nuking of my tank with ciprofloxacin. But I wanted to be a little bit clever about it. I decided to go with the lowest dose that I could find evidence would kill Archibacter. So I didn't really nuke the tank. I did a very carefully dosed uh, treatment of ciprofloxacin just to the level that I thought would kill Archibacter, but not other stuff. Archibacter turns out to be very sensitive to this antibiotic. Okay, so a low dose, treated it for about a week absolutely absent after that treatment and the corals uh, cleared up. I had no more brown jelly disease in the tank. I've since had several um, clients did exactly the same treatment, the same dosage and had the same effect. Ciprofloxacin cleared up their um, brown jelly disease. Now, one of the major concerns with an in-tank antibiotic treatment, and it's the reason most of us didn't do such silly things, is you're worried it's gonna destroy the rest of the microbiome. This was not at all the case. Here's the microbial community before brown jelly disease. 
here it is when the brown jelly disease occurred. You notice that's actually quite disrupted, right? When the, when the BJD was in the tank, it's actually quite a different community than pre-BJD. I hadn't done anything chemically. All I had done was put some corals in and they happened to be infected. Now, after my antibiotic treatment, you can see that my uh, community is back to something very similar to the initial community. It's certainly not, certainly not destroyed. It's certainly not you know, wiped out. Um, and we saw, um, uh, and my last point on this slide is to say that actually that community that's been um, reestablished after the treatment is actually pretty similar to the, the typical reef tank community. So Cipro treatments in your tank, if they're at this low dosage, uh, are effective in wiping out Archibacter and do not wipe out the rest of the bacteria. But I really want to caution two points about this. Number one, let's not do this prophylactically. Uh, this is how you develop antibiotic resistance problems, right? Um, let's use antibiotics only as a treatment rather than as a preventative. Um, and two, please be careful with your dosages because really, you know, a higher dosage than this, and I think there's a good chance you are going to kill lots of stuff in the tank. Yeah. Is Archibacter more of a film or in solution bacteria? I mean, could you isolate your torches and dip them? Would that yeah. be enough to... So we find it only in the water samples. We don't find it in the biofilm samples, but I'm sure it's associated with the torches. I mean, it must be because it's directly... Um, so in terms of dips as a treatment, you know, I tried that, um, like, like many of us, I mean, we've probably all lost some euphilia in this room, if, if we want to admit it or not. Um, I've, I've lost a lot of euphilia. And, you know, I've, I tried a lot of dips and I didn't have any success with them, but I, I, you know, I can't say it will not work, just I have not. Do you think prophylactically dipping sets it up or no? You know, I, Without having done it, I don't want to, I, I don't know, maybe. A any preventative use of antibiotics, I have concerns about resistance, but that doesn't speak to whether, you know, it might work. Yeah. Is Archibacter one of the things that you would test for? To so the that's right. Yeah, it shows up flagged as, as a suspected pathogen. If you have it in your tank, it'll show up. Yep. Uh, old formats of the report. So like if you got your tank tested, a year ago, I might not have been screening for this. We're constantly updating the things we screen for, but in the current versions of the report, yeah, that, that'll show up. I just don't see, I got a report in January, and I just don't see it on the list. So, uh, it so it's, it's, it's under the suspected coral pathogens, yeah. and that section doesn't list anything unless you have them. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't give you a list of everything we're searching for. Um, it just tells you if you have them. It. So it's just, just a code issue, yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like you don't have Archibacter. Yeah. So I have a question about sure. Cipro. I've yep. heard of people using it for um, like anemones. Is that the same type of bacteria? So I haven't seen any data on what bacteria they're trying to knock out in anemones. I've, I've read that too as kind of a preventative treatment with yeah. newly imported anemones. Um, I, haven't, I haven't read any data on what kind of bacteria. Okay. I see that I'm running behind time, so I'm gonna speed up a bit. Please feel free to keep the questions coming. I'm just explaining why I'm speeding up. Okay, here's turning the corner now to how you can adjust the microbiome, right? Um, the first thing I wanna say about adjusting the microbiome, we're gonna start at, um, establishing the microbiome in a new tank. And this is, a, this is a, a message I suspect most of you have heard before that um, you can establish a good microbiome, a healthy microbiome with live rock. I had heard that message too, but I hadn't seen good data on it. So one of the first things I did when I started the company was run some experiments to actually get some data. Um, so we got some live rock, a couple of different sources. I set up a bunch of replicate identical tanks, key feature in any experiment, replicate uh, experimental units. And I, and I simply set these tanks up and, and ran them for about a month. Um, the figure shows pretty compelling evidence that live rock produces a much higher diversity, uh, a much more diverse microbial community and pretty rapidly compared to dry rock. The dry rock effectively never increased over the whole month that we monitored it, whereas the live rock within about two weeks had already achieved a diversity comparable to um, the median diversity 
of all tanks. That That's not one of the things you wrote. You said you actually, on some of that, you actually used off the shelf bacteria starter cultures, which did not really form anywhere near. Like That's that. right. And I, I, don't, I don't have those data here in the talk anywhere, but um, yeah, you know, frankly, I was hesitant to present them too aggressively in public because the manufacturers right. might have been a little pissed, right. you know. Um, yet, when I first ran the experiment, the dry rock and the dry rock plus bottle bacteria, there was no difference whatsoever. Yeah, I saw Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't want to take too strong a stand against bottled products, but I, I, I do think they have their place in the hobby. There are functions that bottled products can serve, but I think they have sometimes been in the hot in the hobby been pitched as kind of a panacea, kind of a, a cure-all, just, just put some bottled products in there and it's gonna fix all your bacterial issues. Um, certainly for establishing a new tank, it does not appear to help your diversity at all. So, so say I go to the Oregon coast and I get some, uh, I, select, I scoop that right? I'll yeah. select the uh, shallow water rocks, you know, coal skeletons, yeah. coal, the clam skeleton, stuff like that, and the water. How, what's the difference between a, a temperate versus a tropical uh, biome? Is yeah, a completely different biome? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this is an experiment I've wanted to do myself. I haven't done it. I've got to say, I don't know the answer. I, I strongly suspect the I, suspect, I, I thought about going in there, yeah. bring it in, put it in a warm water tank, culture it, and then send it to you and see right. what that happens. Right. Right. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident if you do that experiment, you're going to get some that survive and some that don't. Um, you know, there is extreme temperature variation within right. the marine but habitat. I don't get all the tropical yeah. tests that come yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, you, it, may be a, it may be a nice strategy for avoiding some tropical pests. I think the best answer to your question has to be that we just don't know. I haven't done it yet, but um, someone should do it because it would be really interesting to know if we could get some benefit from, you know, sand from the Oregon coast. Um, I have a question. Please. I, yeah. I, I have a tank where I, I have only dry rock in it. Mm. Um, and the only thing I'm doing is taking for water changes, I'm just taking water from my established aquarium and then doing water changes with that one. Yeah, cool. To, to swap out the water. Right. It, would that be better than just having, you know, more, more live rock or surface like type film on that or? I guess I, guess I don't want to say it would be better. I, 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 I want to say it, it, it will do something, right? Yeah. Um, you, you are, you are um, inoculating a live bacterial culture by doing that, and it's the water community that you're inoculating. Um, I guess what I want to say is that the biofilm community is so different that you you would likely get a different community if if you did this with sand and rock rather than just water. Um, but I yeah I I do think that this is a practice people maybe have not done enough of in the hobby. We've maybe focused only on the sand and rock and um, in particular for the Pelagibacteraceae, you, you're not going to get a lot of those guys with sand and rock, um, but you will by transferring some water. Maybe the best answer is a bit of both if, okay. if you really want to transplant. Do you know the difference between, uh, you know, live rock, ergo, I bought it from Florida and they flew it here, and say rock from a two or three year old aquarium? Right. What does that community look Yeah, like? I mean, I, you know, I, I feel bad at some level. My, my question to, to all of these, um, my answer to all of these questions is going to be, I don't know, because I haven't done that exact measurement yet, right? But based on what we do know, I see diversity going down in tanks over time. We've, we've measured quite a few tanks now for a year or two, and, and we see declines in diversity over time. I think that it stands to reason a tank, a, a rock that's pulled out of some established reef tank is going to have lower diversity in it than a tank, uh, a rock pulled out of the ocean, because in a tank, we do see this decline over time. Um, competition among families leads to some families being out competing uh, over is, time. That was going to be one of my questions. On, is, we'll say to put it in. Mm. How do you maintain a diverse, given that like competition and, and yeah. you know, um, <clears throat> How do you maintain? Yeah, well, that, this is a good question too. Um, yeah, maybe maybe this is more of an open-ended question that we can discuss more at the end because I I don't have an answer to it, and I think it's a uh, it comes down to sort of schools of thought. But um, if you wanted to maintain 
a diverse, uh, high diversity over time. I think, I think it's pretty clear that um, supplementing it repeatedly is going to be a useful strategy. I, I don't see, certainly don't see tanks increasing over time and really consistently I'm seeing decreases in diversity uh, over time. Hey, hey guys, can yes. we, um, can we hold the questions to the end from now on just so we feel like we get through the rest of the slides? Great question. So. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, so I just showed you that Live Rock establishes a diverse community, right? It, it brings a bunch of different kinds of microbes into your tank. I want to briefly make the point here that it also establishes the right community, that is the normal or typical families. Um, and again, I've just pulled out a few examples to make it less complex. My point here is to have you focus on the typical bar at the top, right? Um, so these top three families, these are families that are found at high levels in a typical reef tank. And you can see that Live Rock B also established high levels of these families, right? So this Live Rock, this source of Live Rock was effective in um, producing a community that looks like a typical community. It has the right families in it. Now check out the Dry Rock. Dry Rock had very high levels of three families that are not present at high levels in a normal reef tank. So dry rock actually promotes kind of the overgrowth of the wrong kinds of bacteria. Um, another point I wanna make on this slide, not all live rock is the same. Look at live rock A versus live rock B. And boy, if you had seen these rocks, you would have said live rock B was, or live rock A was gonna be the winner because this stuff was beautiful. I mean, it had bryozoans growing on it, sponges, stuff was amazing. But on the inside, it was concrete. It was purple concrete covered with a bunch of um, nice life on the outside. Whereas the live rock B, which turned out to be the winner, was uh, dead coral skeletons, that is real live rock, had some coralline algae growing on it, not much else, but by far the winner from a, from a microbial perspective. By the way, live rock B, that's the supplier that we've adopted for all the live reef rubble that, that we're selling. Okay, so live rock is great for establishing a new uh, microbial community. In an existing tank, I really favor live sand or mud as a way of uh, boosting the nitrifying community um, instead of live rock. Live rock works too, but I really think this is a more effective way of um, spreading a lot of the material around your tank. Um, showing just a picture of some of the live sand we're selling. Of course, there's a lot of, lot of sources out there. Um, showing you here, a, a Brief result from an experiment I did where I had four tanks. These are literally four display tanks that I had in my, in my home. Um, and two of them had communities that I wasn't happy with. So I supplemented them with live sand and mud. The other two communities I was okay with. So I treated them as my controls, okay? The untreated ones on the left received no live sand and mud. Now in each series, you have a before and after bar. The before bars are white. The after bars are black. This is a bit confusing to look at because there's some absence data. Okay, the the untreated tanks um, actually had absence across the board. Okay? The treated tanks, on the other hand, you notice that before the treatment they had no nitrite oxidizing bacteria, and after the treatment they had plenty of nitrite oxidizing bacteria. So, I mean, a pretty simple experiment. I'm just demonstrating to you that, yes, if you add live mud and live sand to your tanks, it does boost the levels of nitrite oxidizing bacteria. And that wasn't just a fluke. It didn't happen in the controls. It was truly an effect of the, um, the addition. More broadly, live sand and mud alter the community. So I've just showed you one tiny little slice and said that they increase the levels of nitrite oxidizing bacteria, but that's not all they do. I'm showing you here the before samples for the treated tanks. This is what the communities looked like before we treated them. That's what we looked like after they treated them. Let's not worry about the details. The point is it's different, okay? Adding live sand or mud to your tank really profoundly changed uh, the microbiome. And if you look at the untreated ones, you see that they did not have those major uh, changes. I think the most uh, compelling piece that you can focus on here is look at the Pelagibacteraceae, the pink slice. Notice that both of my treated tanks had very little Pelagi before the treatment 
and they both had plenty of it after the treatment. So live sand and mud will boost your nitrifying communities and they will alter the microbial community in general. I've just told you two good ways you can manipulate the microbial community in your tank. Now let's talk about a bad thing you can do to the microbial community in your tank. I hope there's no UV sterilizer fans here who are gonna throw rocks at me at the end of this slide, but the data say what the data say. UV sterilizers have a profound effect on the microbiome. And by far the biggest effect is the complete removal of the pelagibacteraceae. I'm showing you here two example profiles. So these are two different tanks, just two from my database that I selected. One has a UV sterilizer. Notice there's no pelagi there. The other one lacks a UV sterilizer and it has plenty of them. Now that's just one example, but let's look at the average over a couple hundred tanks. It's something like a 20 fold difference in the levels of pelagibacteraceae. Um, and really it looks more like the picture on the left. Generally, if you have a UV sterilizer, you have no pelagibacteraceae. If you don't have a UV sterilizer, you frequently have high levels of pelagibacteraceae, but still sometimes they're missing. Still, sometimes they haven't been added to the tank in the first place, and so they're not present. Okay, so that is a major consequence of the reef keeper's decision on the microbiome, right? You could literally flip that switch and change the microbiome of your community. And I've had clients who did this, clients who they were running with a UV sterilizer for a while, and then they turned it off, pelagi came back. Turned it back on, pelagi went back. I mean, it's a, um, it's a very striking effect, a very clear effect, and it's easy to understand if you think about it, pelagibacteraceae are free living. So the entire population is circulating through the UV sterilizer. There's no refuge for them because they're just floating around in the water. Think about the rhodobacteraceae. Most of them are stuck on a rock. So the UV sterilizer isn't having as much effect on them because most of the population never goes through the UV sterilizer. Okay, so I've shown you um, the kind of data that we're getting out of these tests. And I've shown you some of the ways that you can use this information to adjust the microbiome in your tank. I wanna close by um, giving you a little teaser about what's coming next um, with, with our services and products. So I think about this in kind of three phases. We've completed phase one here. In the first phase, we've introduced testing, microbiome testing and tank DNA testing. Um, tank DNA testing, I haven't said a word about it today, but really the principle works exactly the same as everything I've told you today, except that we're targeting a different group of organisms. We target eukaryotes, that is everything but the bacteria and archaea. And so that's a, a very similar test that you can use to test for uh, parasites in your tank and other interesting things like uh, diatoms, dinoflagellates, et cetera. So in this first phase, we've introduced um, some tests and also a supplement, uh, live reef rubble. We've just now entered into phase two. In phase two, we're expanding on our offerings of supplements. So we've uh, introduced live reef sand recently. Um, we are working on some prebiotics. What I mean by prebiotics, these are uh, nutrients that you can add to your tank that will influence the community. These are not bacteria themselves, they're nutrients that promote the growth of good bacteria or inhibit the growth of bad bacteria. Um, we've got two of these that we're working on right now, but they're really nowhere near ready to launch yet. This one though, I've got great news for you. Um, the biggest complaint, the biggest uh, downside, obstacle, challenge, whatever you wanna call it in this testing has been the turnaround time. Um, this is by far the fastest microbiome testing service that I'm aware of, but it still takes us a month to get it done. With the new technology that we've just bought, um, this sequencer, this sequencing machine, the Nanopore Min Ion, is a sequencing machine the size of a flip phone. I wish I'd brought my flip phone with you today so I could pretend it was the sequencer. It literally would fit in the palm of your hand. And we've recently purchased it. Um, huge advantage for us because um, this brings the sequencing in-house, so we're not going to have to wait for them to load the samples on the sequencer anymore. Also, this machine runs just incredibly quickly. It runs overnight. 
So um, I anticipate that this is gonna allow us to pull our turnaround times uh, down to two weeks. It'll be a lot of work to get there, but I do think that by the end of phase two, you know, probably by the end of this year, um, we will have that two week turnaround time with the faster sequencer up and running. <clears throat> in phase three, we wanna get even faster. Um, in phase three, we're gonna introduce a qPCR testing uh, service. This will be specific testing. So if you only want to know, do I have ick in my tank? Do I have velvet in my tank? Do I have whatever in my tank? Uh, we will introduce specific tests for that that we can run very quickly and get your results within two days. Um, all of that technology exists. There's no new inventions that have to be made here. It's just a question of scaling up and getting investments and that sort of thing. Um, but that will, that will allow really, really rapid tests, truly about a two-day turnaround. We're also working currently on um, farming some of these supplements so that we don't have to rely so much on importers to bring us live rock and live sand, currently working on farm sand. And we also have some probiotics, true probiotics that we're uh, developing. Again, nowhere near release, but the idea here is to sell true live strains of bacteria that will actually live in your aquarium, unlike much of what you buy on the shelf today, um, and will actually have an influence on the community in, your, in uh, your aquarium. Okay, so that's the roadmap for where we're going over the next few years. Thank you so much for your attention and patience with this talk, and I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Versus a yeah, so this is a distinction between um, prebiotics are nutrients, probiotics are bacteria. Okay. Now, those, dis those terms are not always, that distinction is not always made clear in sort of the advertising literature, but it's, uh, those terms are solid, you know, people stand by those terms, it's just you may see them used loosely in the, in so the advertising. I say prebiotic is a fertilizer? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, so, you know, when you do, um, when you do carbon dosing, you could think of this as a prebiotic. It is, it is influencing the community by promoting the growth of one kind and not other kinds. Now I'd say most of the ways that we're doing carbon dosing are not really benefiting the microbial community, but they're changing it certainly. So, yeah. <clears throat> other questions? Have yeah. Have you done any tests with like, uh, I think I know the one you're talking about. It's marketed as sort of a coral food, right? Yeah, that... uh, yeah. It's. It, I think they they call it like a night trying bacteria that will in turn feed feed the coral. Oh, interesting. It's like, uh, a couple of different bacteria strains. What made me think of it was the. Uh, they talk about rhodocinomonas, and I, I was just interested because the you said the surface film was started with roto, and right? Back, roto bacteriaceae. Or, yep. Uh, so I wonder what if, if you have worked with it. Yeah. So um, I guess a few things I can say on it. I mean, the boring answer is no. I haven't directly tested the product. Um. Uh, but I recall that we were asked that by someone previously and looked up, is it in the database? Can we see it? And, and yes, we can. I mean, if it's in the sample, we will see it. This, this marker will pick it up. It's in the database and we should distinguish it from the other ones. Um, it would be really great to do some tests of that, that product in a tank. Um, I, often get, I often get questions about products. You know, people, people ask me, well, what's in this product or have you tested that product? Um, so maybe I'll say something sort of general about, about product testing. Um, I think it would not be strategically in our interest to come out and release ingredient lists for every manufacturer's proprietary <laughs> ingredients. I, sus I suspect they would not be happy with us, right? Um, and so, you know, it was tempting to do something like that early on, but thought better of it. However, what I want to say is there's absolutely no obstacle to clients coming to me and sending me a sample and I tell you exactly what's in it, right? And then you're free to go post it on Reef to Reef, do, you know, do whatever with it, right? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that. I mean, you, you, the perfect example is right. whatever your product B was. Right. You guess what product B yeah. was in your experiment. Yeah. Uh, it looks like snake oil to me. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's like the back of seven. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so, so, so it doesn't does appear to work. And now I just. I, uh, so, so the, I know a lot of people who dose that like right. as a regimen, like right. you know, after every water change, they put microbacter right. seven in it. So, yeah, without knowing that, I would have used that probably on my dry walk. I would have yeah. used that as my initial culture on my dry walk. So, a couple of things I want to say about so, these, yeah, you know, these, yeah. these products. Um, I, I have tested them, and without releasing ingredients lists, what I can say is. It's really surprising how we never find the ingredients from those products in aquariums. It really makes you stop and think about what are these products doing in the aquarium? I mean, it's live bacteria, but I never find those live bacteria in my aquarium later. I haven't done the experiments, but I strongly suspect most bacterial products do not survive in the aquarium. Just full stop, they're just dead when you pour them in the aquarium. Well, it's like the recent vibrant thing. Yeah. Uh, right, good. maybe not bacterial at all. Right. Yeah. 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 So I think I think we need a lot it's more. The same with with vinegar in it, yeah. You know? So I think we need a lot more testing and ingredient lists in the hobby, and I'm happy to help with that. And maybe we can even do some discounts or something, right? But what I'm not going to do is like release from our company. Hey, here's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other other question. Yeah. Time frame. Time frame for these. Did they say you when you buy a one more week level, say gotcha. Yeah, okay. So the um right, the the live reef sand and the live reef rubble, we try to release these on the same schedule with our test results every month. Um and that's generally mid-month. Um for, for April, um, we're looking at April 18th. Um and so there is a page on the website where you can you can check that the the testing schedule. Um, but yeah, this month it's the 18th. And again, it it all depends if they come back clean. So I can tell you we have the material; it will be in the batch. But if it all shows up with uranema, then we're all out of luck. If I run a tank bare bottom, but I use a inoculating sample of you know put a sand in a container, is there a crossover between bacteria that lives in the sand and bacteria that lives on? The the biofilm services. I assume sure. there's crossover and a lot of the same. Yeah, I, I don't see any reason to, to think Let not. Result, rubble versus sand. Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, in general, there's a lot of exchange among these communities within the aquarium. Yeah. Have you, have you done any tests on, on establishing a tank versus like supplementing it? Like, like you always think, oh, it's all a good idea. Like, I'll just buy some reef rubble and right. pour it in there. But, Again, if the tank, if the biological community is, you know, uh, all the competition, there's no need yeah. for it, right? Yeah. Like what? Yeah, I, I think this is this is an important point. I mean, just just putting new bacteria in the tank does not mean necessarily that you're going to change the community. Um, the, the competition? There's there's competition. There's yeah. there's a lot of competition going on there. Um, so we haven't done. There's an experiment I'd like to do that I think would kind of get at your question, which is I'd love to do side-by-side -side studies on which is more effective in an established tank, live rock, live sand, live mud, bottled bacteria, I don't know. I haven't done such a side-by-side -side experiment. What I can tell you is the data I've showed you that rock works well for establishing a tank, sand works well for modifying a tank once it's already established, but I haven't compared the two side-by-side, -side, so I really can't say for sure, yeah. which would work better. My gut feeling from having seen clients experiment with these things is that I think sand is the better way to go for an established tank. And I suspect it has to do with surface area, just huge surface area on all those grains of sand, right? Yeah. Versus a few pieces of rock. Yeah. So, so after say if you're establishing a tank, you put bacteria in there, what should be the, you know, tank new tanks pretty sterile, what should be uh, what should you do to make sure you throw a shrimp in there? What should you do the process? Gotcha. How to feed them? Yeah, great question. So, right. I know a lot of people are fans of pure ammonia, and and I think there's, I think there's a lot of logic to that. If if you're just focusing on the nitrifying community, that's all you need, right? Put in the ammonia, they convert it to nitrite, and then that feeds the nitrite oxidizers, and you've got the whole cycle. Um, 
I think if you're if you're trying to promote a more complex, more diverse community, it makes sense to give them a more complex food. So for for a for a quick start, you know, if you just want to get fish up and running as quick as possible, nitrifying bacteria and ammonia is probably the quickest way to go. But my own practice when I'm starting a tank with a with a more diverse community is to do ghost feeding. I don't do a big chunk of shrimp, but same idea, a small amount of any high quality aquarium food at a maybe once a week. Exactly. Yeah. My my goal is just feed more than just the nitrifiers. Yeah. yeah. Feed the bad stuff. Thank you. So we have a question um, from the chat about whether the Pelagibacteraceae are have been shown to be successful uh, to be necessary for a reef tank. Really important question, and I, I've got to admit, no. These are really hard. These are really hard experiments to do. Um, you know, think about that. Would what that would take? And I, and I'm I'm not at all criticizing the question. This is I think the central the central question for a lot of these these differences that I'm showing you. You know, if I show you here's a difference between two communities, you should be wondering, does that difference even matter, right? Um, and so we've just gotten a very good question about that. The Pelagibacteraceae, do they really matter? UV sterilizers wipe them out, but does it matter? I don't have evidence to, to tell you it does matter. Um, what I will say is I suspect it matters for a couple of reasons. In nature, corals are constantly being bombarded with bacteria. Bacteria swimming around through the water column are coming in contact with corals. Most of those bacteria are Pelagibacteraceae. In an aquarium with a UV sterilizer, corals are constantly be, being bombarded with bacteria, but none of them are Pelagibacteraceae. So if there's any role for bacteria in coral health, whether it's bacteria as food for the corals, and there's a lot of coral biologists that think corals actually do get meaningful nutrition from bacteria, or pathogens, right? Interactions like bacteria coming in and establishing a pathogenic um, infection. If there's, if there's any meaning to any of those relationships, then the community of bacteria that's interacting with the corals has to matter, right? Um, so I, I can't tell you that the Pelagibacteraceae are absolutely necessary. And in fact, I can tell you for sure, we find successful tanks that run UV sterilizers and do not have Pelagibacteraceae. So I do not want to pretend that your tank is gonna die if you, um, if you don't have this group. Um, but what I will say is it is a profound difference between your tank and the natural ocean. So my, my bias is always that we should try to um, simulate the natural reef environment. And this is a pretty big difference between the natural reef environment and, a, and an aquarium. So that's my reasoning. But again, um, you will see successful tanks with none of this group. So it is, it is possible. Andy had a question. Yeah, question about uh, diversity versus balance. Yeah. So uh, maybe at the beginning of, of this work, uh, the thought was maybe that having a high diversity was the most important thing. Right. And then, um, and then with more and more data, you saw tanks changing over time. Yep. And sometimes converging on, on the same community. Yeah. And if they have the same community, then we get a higher balance score. I wonder if you could reflect on. Uh, is it really important to have high diversity at the beginning right. to ensure that you end up in the right place balance wise or uh, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. so, so um, Andy's asking about these two measures uh, of, the, of the microbial community. Diversity, we've talked a lot about today, how many different types and balance is a number we haven't talked about so much today. Balance is a number that quantifies how normal is the community. Um, it's a it's a number I arrive at by comparing your community with the typical community and doing some math. And and as Andy's suggesting, <clears throat> you know we we have always had this this uh, assumption that high diversity is good and maybe even necessary. Over time, and in in tanks like Andy's, Andy Andy has a beautiful tank. Um, that over time we have seen the diversity decline, but the balance is quite high. And I've seen 
several other tanks like that, tanks that are established for several years. We see declining diversity, but a nice high balance with a nice high pelagibacteraceae level. I've come to associate that pattern with, frankly, a tank like yours. Like, wow, that's, that's probably a pretty healthy tank with some nice, happy corals growing in it. Um, so I, I have started to relax my assumption that we always need high diversity. Um, the suggestion that you made is, is kind of how I'm coming to, to think of it. Um, diversity, in my mind, has always been a proxy. That is, diversity itself isn't the thing we care about, this number. What we care about is actually getting all the different functions in there. And diversity was just a way of getting there. It was sort of a, a strategy for getting all the right types. Um, if you want to collect all the right types, you just collect all the types, and it will include the right types. And I think uh, in terms of the, the development of the community over time, like you're talking about, yeah, maybe it makes sense that the diversity is more important early to ensure that the right types get into the tank at the beginning. And maybe we should accept lower diversity, accept declining uh, diversity over time. Um, there's probably some limits to that. You know, I haven't seen any of these healthy tanks that have super low diversity, right? It's always kind of moderate to low diversity. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a changing, um, our perspective is evolving over time as we see the range of tanks, the range of different micro, microbial communities that can support um, a healthy tank. You know, and it comes, it comes to some extent back to the question that Shane asked. Like, it's it's pretty hard to uh, it's pretty hard to prove a lot of these things. You know, what what diversity level do you need for healthy corals? That that would be a pretty hard experiment to set up, right? Um, what uh, what's the functional benefit of having a certain level of pelagibacteraceae in your tank? So I, I think a lot of these things were just limited by how difficult the experiments are. Yeah. Happy to take any more questions? Yes. Have you done any experiments on like, um, like skin mate and to see the, the micro, the microbiology, what is taken out? with a skimmer right i haven't it's on the list I, okay. I i really want to do that yeah um it strikes me it strikes me it's the, the sampling's gonna be a bit tricky i, I yeah. don't want to collect the skimmate in the cup i want to collect like the bubbles right, right? because yeah, I can send a box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it yeah send me send me bottles of skimmate I'll... <laughs> you know when i got into this microbiome world i swore to myself a lot of microbiome work is done on poop, right? And I swore to myself, I am never studying poop. That's, I draw the line. <laughs> I think skim eight crosses the line. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's a really interesting question to see, are we, are we pulling specific groups out um, you know, when we use a skimmer? Uh, it's a hard question to answer from the database because you know, in the database, I've got a bunch of people with UV and a bunch of people without. So I could ask these questions in the database. You know, is there a difference between those groups? Man, everybody's got a skimmer. Like, yeah. I might have one or two people in my database without a skimmer. So I think I we'd have, have to have do skimmer, so sampling. I, I, ah, I, nice. I, 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 Let's I, sample. I know, right? Yep. But my yeah. Are right. yeah. <laughs> I, I say everybody runs a skimmer. I turn mine off in my Zoa tank sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. How how is the database evolving? And, and also, when you order microbiome, is the ideal or what you present is? Let me back up. Are you presenting the microbiome in really good tanks, or is that a true average of everything mm. that you've received? Like this is you know. Yeah. Important question. So that um that slice the the slice of tanks that I use for the average is somewhat curated. So um, I've gotten a lot of tanks back from people that they were like experimental tanks. You know, they, they were, um, I mean, we've, we've got some biologists that send us samples. We've got some coral farmers that send us samples. Point is like a lot of my samples are clearly not normal reef tanks. So they're, they're kicked out of the data set right away in terms of calculating an average. Um, uh, yeah, and there's there's a handful of other reasons, you know, people who specifically said this tank just had a tank crash or whatever. So so basically, I 
for that subset, that average tank, it's only the tanks that didn't have any of those red flags attached to them and also had enough at a technical level, they worked well enough to be um, to be worth including that. Yeah, yeah. So it's not truly every tank; it's yeah. the good tanks. Do you ever get a sample and right away just like, oh my god, bro, what? <laughs> like they spill bleach in here. So I, I'm wondering, you know, on the sidelines. Yeah. Like, I, I got a sample, and I was like, I know this guy's just messing with me. <laughs> I know he just took. He's probably watching. Um, uh, I know he just took a just took a sample from a mud puddle because you know what I'm finding in this sample? I'm finding lots of um, dirt fungi. Now, I'm not like a fungus expert, but I find the names and I go look them up and I go, wait, this is all dirt, right? They, they all live in terrestrial soil. Um, I found tree, you know, trees, tree DNA, right? Other terrestrial plants. So it's like everything in there was terrestrial or freshwater. I'm like, what is this? So I wrote the guy and it turned out it was an absolutely massive tank that he had, um, I mean, I don't know, thousands of gallons, I don't remember. And he had, he had put a lot of dry rock in it, mine dry rock. And he said, I know there was a bunch of dirt. Like it, it was dirty, mine dry rock. So um, yeah, you know, wh when we get really unusual results, they do jump at us. It's what is this thing? Yeah. Yeah, we find some weird stuff, especially in the, the, the tank DNA samples, um, human skin fungus. I mean, all kinds of, all kinds of interesting things show up yeah. these days. And you report that back on the uh, personalized email, by the way, you may want to get that nail fungus uh, so, treated. So the, the skin fungus one, um, it's included on every report, but I never mention it because every person and every sample has it. So yeah, you've got it just like everyone else does, right? Um, uh, yeah, th there are a couple other, uh, there's a couple other ones that I have reported, you know, human, human parasites. There was a, there was a, a protist, a human protist parasite that causes, causes human digestive issues. Um, so I reported that to the guy and said, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't siphon from your, your tank with your mouth. You know, <laughs> that's what I normally do. But if I find that thing in my tank, I'm not, I'm not mouth siphoning anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know how much of that's in the water or like on people's hands when they're sampling, though. I mean, it's E. coli is just everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Regarding carbon dosing and, mm. and the bacterial bloom that really are the change in balance, significant yeah. change in balance you get from people yeah. who do carbon dosing. Are those bacteria not competing other potential beneficial bacteria that you've seen? Yeah, so the, the effects that I see from carbon dosing, um, there's three families, depending, and we haven't really nailed down, you know, which source of carbon tends to promote which of these families, but we see variation, okay? There's three families that are promoted by carbon dosing, the Alteromonadaceae, Fusobacteriaceae, Oceanospiralaceae. All three of those are normally present in the microbiome, but if you carbon dose, one or more of them will just bloom to, to huge proportions. So in that sense, they're doing exactly what you said. They're out competing, right? Um, they're taking up nutrient space that other bacteria want. Um, the other big effect that we see beyond just the, the whole community, we do see um, low nitrifying communities in carbon dose tanks. Um, and this, it's funny, you know, people think about carbon dosing as a way of getting rid of nitrate. Right, or nitrate and phosphate. Um, but in fact, I mean, heterotrophic growth by bacteria, they're perfectly happy to take up ammonia and nitrite too. So it's really competing with the ammonia, the nitrifying community too. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not saying don't do carbon dosing. I'm just saying there is this interaction. I mean, exactly as you're suggesting, it's competition uh, for nutrients. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it has. It has a big effect on the microbiome to, to carbon dose. So if you do bio pellet, the film actually grows on the bio pellet itself. That's not likely to be a yeah, interesting. Compete with the nitrous. Uh, that would be really interesting to test. We haven't done any like swabs on bio pellet. Um, in fact, we could even do water samples, but it'd be great to yeah swab the pellets themselves. That would be cool. The pellet dissolving into the water. No, the bacteria is actually cooling on the film. Okay. Mm. The film. Okay. 
Okay. So I'm going to take yeah. your, your output from that and run it right by the skin and suck it into the Gotcha, yeah. Assuming you have a single point. Well, the bacteria is eating the pellet <coughs> and okay. growing as a film, and then it slows, sloughs off, sloughs off, and that's gotcha. why you don't have the skin right there. Yeah. I was dosing a lot of vinegar and I tapered it off over two weeks and then I got diagnosed. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. So well, like, well, a couple yeah. months ago. So I think you need to wrap it up now and you just you do your questions. questions after. Yeah. Works yeah. for so me. Yeah. Are you still here? Yep. Yeah. Well, for anybody still hanging out online, thanks for listening. Send me email questions if you have them. Thanks again. Thanks yep. again. <clears throat> Well, you should sell the microbiome from from established coral farmers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Although, as an add-on. <laughs>